So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Maximizing Health Information Exchange in a Pediatric Practice. My name is and I'm a program manager in the Center for Health Information Technology and Innovative Care Delivery at the Maryland Healthcare Commission. MHCC is an independent regulatory agency one MHCC priority is to increase the use of data among policymakers, payers, providers, purchasers, and patients to improve the quality, affordability, and outcomes of healthcare delivered in the state. We do this by providing timely and accurate information to policymakers, payers, purchasers, providers, and the public on the availability, cost, and quality of healthcare services. During today's webinar, you'll hear from Dr. Daniels, a Maryland-based pediatrist, about the clinical benefits of using health information exchange, including how you can use radiology and laboratory reports from CRIS, the state-designated health, health information exchange, or HIE. You will also hear from Dr. Patel about CRIS services you can incorporate into your workflow and how you can participate in CRIS. So before we get started, I would like to cover a few operational items. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted to MHCC's website. A copy of the slides will be emailed to all participants. Continuing medical education credit will be offered for this webinar. More information will be provided at the end of the webinar. At this time, all webinar participants are muted to limit any background noise during the presentations. There will be opportunities to comment and ask questions during the Q&A session of the event. You may enter your comment or question in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I will read these out loud to the presenters at the time of the Q&A session. You can also raise your hand and I will call on you when it's your turn to ask a question. So I'll begin by providing an overview of health information technology, its value to pediatrists and MHCC's role in supporting diffusion of health IT statewide. Many of you are familiar with these technologies, but I would like to make some defining points about these key components of health IT. EHRs connect the business side of your practice with the clinical side. It brings together the responsibilities of the front desk like billing, payment, and appointment scheduling with the providers who enter treatment information. HIE is the secure electronic exchange of health information. Dr. Daniels and Patel will get into more detail about this later in the presentation. Telepodiatry services include virtual wound care for diabetic patients and foot examinations consisting of assessment of lower extremity vasculature, neurological status, wound characteristics, and so on. The MHCC advances health IT statewide to ensure that providers have the right information at the right time and place of care to improve treatment, prevent errors, and reduce healthcare costs. The MHCC's plan for advancing health IT balances the need for information sharing with strong privacy and security policies. The items listed on this slide provides a glimpse of our leading HIE activities. Health IT is also central to modernizing care delivery. As hospitals and primary care providers take on value-based care delivery approaches and models, Health IT offers the ability to share comprehensive patient information. Additionally, patients expect that their information will be available in digital formats, and some prefer to interact with their providers through technology. The ongoing shift to value-based care is increasing the need for providers to exchange patient health information in a timely manner, and health IT is key to achieving the goals of value-based care. Federal programs like HITECH, I'm sorry, federal policies like HITECH and the 21st Century Cares Act established programs to promote health IT. Additionally, state legislation such as House Bill 1127, which I will discuss in the next slide, 
promotes health IT by advancing the electronic exchange of health-related information. House Bill 1127, Public Health State Designated Exchange Health Data Utility, establishes an HDU operated by the state designated HIE, CRISP. CRISP currently makes clinical information securely available for care delivery and select public health initiatives. In an HDU role, CRISP will further integrate health data that serves as a foundation for knowledge and innovation. An HDU in Maryland will lead to improved care delivery and outcomes, address health disparities, and inform public health interventions through modernized infrastructure. The legislation became effective on October 1st, 2022, and requires MHCC to develop supporting regulations, which we plan to do by working collaboratively with stakeholders. The HDU will be designed to assist Maryland's providers, payers, and public health agencies to tackle challenges associated with health data access in ways that achieve greater economies of scale. We learned from the COVID-19 public health emergency that gaps between public health and clinical care poses risk to healthcare delivery. The HDU will reduce this risk and support healthcare transformation by serving as a data cultivator, curating and analyzing information across healthcare community, communities to produce reports, insights, and actionable data. The HGU will also serve as a public resource that enables the healthcare community to achieve shared goals of strengthening public health response in ways that address health inequities and improve care delivery. So I would like to highlight a few health IT resources. The MHCC's Podiatry Learning Network provides education targeted to podiatrists on a range of health IT and advanced care delivery topics, such as cybersecurity, telehealth, and the Mary Bay's Incentive Payment System. The Telehealth Virtual Resource Center, or TVRC, includes resources for providers and consumers, such as best practice tips on privacy and security considerations for remote patient monitoring, and coverage and billing requirements for RPM or remote patient monitoring. Lastly, the Health Data Utility webpage provides information on MHCC's activities towards implementing an HGU in Maryland, including an HGU framework that was released last month. So next, I'll turn it over to Dr. Daniels, who will provide information about how he uses CRISP in his practice. Okay, I guess I should unmute myself and get you out of my picture. All right, my slide's visible now. <laughs> Can you hear me? I do not see your slides yet, Dr. Daniels. Okay, let's try this again. How about now? Yes, there we go. Okay, just my slides, right? <laughs> just your slides. Okay, well, uh, thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. It's nice to see a bunch of names of people I've met over the years and the new names that I haven't met before. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Daniels. I work uh, with We Treat Feet, uh, primarily in the Baltimore metropolitan area. And I've been in practice a little over 20 years. And the juxtaposition of my practice these days revolves around wound patients. I spend a lot of time at an inpatient, uh, in doing inpatient wounds as well as an outpatient wound center associated with the local hospitals. And as a result, my patients tend to be pretty sick and they tend to bounce around from hospital to hospital and doctor to doctor. So uh, a lot of them not being the greatest historians in the world, it makes it difficult to make sure that we don't duplicate services and that we provide them the most appropriate care necessary. And this is where CRISP comes in. This is why I use it and why I think everybody should. Okay. Um, no, we'll go. There we go. Um, so today we're, we're going to cover, and Dr. Patel will cover the, the ins and outs of the, the CRISP portal itself, so I, I won't bore you with, with that. She's way too more, she's forgotten more than I ever know about it. Uh, but the idea here is to improve care coordination, reduce errors, increase efficiency, and improve patient outcomes. We want to limit the times that we reorder the same tests over and over again. We want to know what the history of the patient is from where they came from or from other visits that they've had. And we want to make sure that the patients are giving us all the information we need. 
Um, I always use the example of the patients who are on three or four different medications and then tell you they don't have any medical problems. So it's, if you can get this information ahead of time or as part of your workup, it makes things a lot easier to understand. Um, so CRISP itself, as I said, Dr. Patel will go into that, but that's the nonprofit, uh, the not-for-profit health exchange that we have here in Maryland. Uh, and it's an electronic exchange and it allows, you know, providers, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, uh, other healthcare professionals access uh, in a secure fashion to patients' vital medical information. And the purpose of this is to benefit from um, the information that comes, that, that, that remains to avoid uh, readmissions, try to reduce readmissions, uh, avoid medication errors or duplications, uh, improve diagnoses, uh, and decrease duplicate testing. No, wrong way. Okay. So benefits. First, this is a secure method for us to get medical history, lab results, and medication lists. You know, primary things that we're doing with all of our patients, especially our new patients or patients we haven't encountered in some time. Um, we can look up access to other healthcare organizations. So for example, uh, I work with LifeBridge. So when people are in the Hopkins system or the University of Maryland system, this gives me access to a bunch of their material. Uh, Chris will provide you real-time alerts for your patients if you set them up. Oops, a typo. Uh, and there are public health information that gets put here. During the pandemic, a lot of stuff was there. If you log on or if you do log on to CRISP afterwards, you'll see there's still COVID areas where you can check COVID testing for patients and items along that line that, that help people. Um, so with improved care coordination, you're getting medicine lists, you're getting lab results, and you're getting uh, radio radiology tests. And, you know, this is just going to help make decisions better. It's going to provide you quicker access to the information. Uh, the, the patients will receive better treatment. And if you're in my world where a lot of these patients have infections and, you know, you need to work them up for the vascular issues and work them up for any communicable diseases, it, it, makes, it makes a big difference. Um, it also reduces medical errors. Uh, one of the problems I found with electronic medical records is, is that once there's a mistake in the record, it just seems to get duplicated over and over again. So being able to check the records against outside records will provide you sometimes uh, a little bit of knowledge about maybe a mistake that's there. Um, this is also going to increase your efficiency. You don't have to spend time calling medical director departments at hospitals or calling other physicians' offices to get tests faxed over. Um, a lot of this information is available to you uh, on the CRISP portal. All of this is going to help with your care coordination. And anything that reduces medical errors is only beneficial not only for us, but especially for our patients. So where do you find CRISP? So we use Cerner Power Chart at the hospital, and we have this nice little CRISP button on the side. And when you click it uh, inside a patient's chart, you will have this little box comes up, and sometimes you have more than one patient with the same name. You can check their date of birth or address to verify where they are. And then once you click through their name, you will get a tab that has information available on it, uh, such as laboratory reports, radiology, clinical notes, uh, hospital encounters, ED notes, discharge summaries, things along those lines that are very beneficial in providing care. Uh, if you don't have a button on your EHR or your hospital system, you can go to crisphealth.org and you can access it the same way. You click the little login button and you'll get all of this nice information here. There's my little login, there's my email address. Uh, and that was the page that you will get for the patient. And as I mentioned, you can see the COVID lab tools that are sitting there, uh, along with several other items that are going to allow you to, to get proper patient information. And just going along, this was Gilbert Grape, who is the test patient. Um, I think something's eating him. Uh, but anyway, once you click through, you get... You click through the name, you'll see that you get uh, days, you get overlapping opioids, um, you get prescribers and prescription information along with the medical record information that's available for these patients. So importantly, how does it help me? So I hope everybody's aware, but they changed the way our ENMs are done uh, about two years ago. Uh, and a lot of it changed as far as what we're normally doing. For those of us that have been around a long time, sometimes these are a little bit uncomfortable if you're used to billing certain ways and all of a sudden you find out that you're underbilling based on what you're doing. But everything now revolves around medical decision-making. 
Um, and when you read through the categories and you look at what is now a low visit, a moderate visit, or a high visit, what you'll start to see is, is when it comes to data review, um, you don't have to do a lot to get to much higher levels of billing. So for example, uh, if you have somebody who has you know, a chronic illness with an exacerbation or two stable chronic illnesses or a new problem, and you go on to CRISP and you look at an x-ray report and the most recent labs and say a hospital discharge note or a note from their primary care physician, that's three pieces of information. That already gets you into a level four. Um, you know, I was always uncomfortable billing level fours my whole career, but this is where you get with this information and it's readily available and it's available very quick and inefficiently, excuse me, efficiently and uh, inexpensively. Uh, it doesn't really cost us anything, which is really, really nice. So I will uh, take questions at the end, uh, but remember the whole point here is to improve patient satisfaction, uh, share information with other providers, reduce medical errors, and improve long-term outcomes and better health solutions for our patients uh, with foot and ankle problems. And uh, that is the end of my presentation. So thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Daniels. I will now um, transition it over to Dr. Patel. If you could uh, stop sharing your screen. Yep, uh, stop sharing, there we go. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen. All right, are you able to see my screen now? Great. Yes, you awesome. Um, so I am going to kind of take it back um, one step, um, perhaps from where Dr. Daniels was speaking and kind of give you a, a general overview of CRISP and um, all of the, the things that we do. Um, so just a little bit of background that- um, Dr. Believe... Daniels, I'm sorry, before, oh, sorry, Dr. Ahead. Patel, before you proceed, can you uh, click on the display settings right up top, up front? Uh, oh, there sure. you go. Uh-huh. And then that the first one, yes. So that way it's bigger for us. There you go. Is Thank that better? You. Yes, that's perfect. perfect. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think it was mentioned earlier that CRISP um, is the state designated health information exchange for Maryland. Um, but I do wanna note that we have um, affiliate uh, partners in West Virginia, DC, Connecticut, Alaska, and Virginia. And so if you have patients that either are residents of those facilities or of those states or are going to facilities in those states, um, we do have data sharing uh, occurring across those borders. And this is just a quick snapshot of our timeline, just so that you get a sense of, you know, where, we've, where we were um, when we were first um, kind of conceived and the evolution of CRISP as an HIE. We really um, started off as very much just wanting to connect you know, provider A and provider B understanding what was happening with their shared patients. And as we've evolved through the years, we've started to add in really robust data sets, including claims. Um, we support the PDMP and of course the health data utility uh, functionality that we're starting soon. Um, and please excuse the screaming baby in the background if you can hear him. <laughs> Um, so quick um, snapshot of the CRISP services that we provide. We kind of like to bucket them into five categories. The first is um, our point of care tools, which is really where Dr. Daniels focused when he was speaking. These are really kind of your bread and butter, you know, your labs, radiology reports and images, clinical notes, um, advanced care documents and things like that. These are things that are available to you as providers um, and other staff in your office if appropriate. Um, to really understand what's going on with your patients. Um, we also have um, care coordination tools. Um, probably the most popular of those tools is our encounter notification service, which is a roster or panel-based service in which you tell us who your patients are and we will tell you anytime those patients are going in and out of hospital settings. Um, and so it's a really great way to just track where your patients are and participate in the care coordination of those patients as they're moving across settings. The third bucket of services that we support are population health related services, and that's through our CRISP reporting services suite. Um, and we use administrative claims data and increasingly 
uh, bumping that up against clinical data um, to develop analytics and reports really to understand your population at that higher level, not really an individual patient level, but more population health and kind of understanding trends and utilization for your patients. We also support the state in program administration, um, and so as part of the total cost of care model, the state um, supports various programs that are, you know, hospital focused, specialty practice focused, uh, primary care focused, um, and many times Chris is tasked with administering those programs, both from data analytics, but also communicating with CMS making sure that required reporting is completed. And so we do play that administrative role often. And then lastly, with the public health data utility, um, of course, COVID is kind of the, the buzzword that's kept us going these last few years. But as you know, the public health emergency is winding down, we really are working with the state uh, and we have a wonderful relationship with the state um, in terms of identifying where else can the HIE provide support um, at that public health, population health level um, to really keep Marylanders healthier and happier. And then the table on the right, I just wanted to kind of highlight um, just how much data is flowing through CRIS. I mean, we really are probably one of the most robust HIEs in the country. Um, and so you can see that we are delivering, I mean, millions of pieces of information on a typical week. Um, so chances are, if you're looking for something about a patient, you will likely find a piece of information that you perhaps didn't have um, access to otherwise. And so I, um, I just wanted to highlight, I know this looks a little bit complicated, but I just wanted to highlight kind of how the data flows um, through our systems. And so on the left, um, you can see that there are various data types that CRISP, that go into the CRISP infrastructure, including health department data, immunizations, death data from vital statistics, and of course, participant data that includes labs and radiology reports, et cetera. All of those data types come in various formats. They are ingested into our core infrastructure matched to the patients for which that data is for, uh, normalized and often um, you know, cleaned up um, through our really robust algorithms. And then once we have a handle and have mastered that data, we are then able to push that data out um, for end users in many different formats. One of which is the secure portal that Dr. Daniels showed. Um, some folks like to see flat file Excel reports for certain pieces of data. Um, we also have um, you know, other means of sending information out to our end users. And so that's kind of the output of how data is shared. Just a quick note on privacy and security. I know we always want to make sure that we are um, protecting patient data. Um, and Chris is very, very aware of the importance of that. Um, just so that you know that Maryland is an opt out state when it comes to the sharing of uh, health data through the HIE. And what that means is patient data is going to be shared unless the patient actively opts out. And if you do choose to participate in CRISP, um, we have educational materials. Our website has patient um, uh, education materials um, that lets patients know their rights and um, their options uh, should they wish to opt out of the HIE. If the patient does opt out of the HIE, there will be no information available to view by end users. They have said they do not want their data shared. And so we do block all of their data. The only exception to that information uh, is that by Maryland law, um, we cannot uh, apply opt-outs to the prescription drug monitoring program data and select public health information. Um, for example, COVID, um, those things by Maryland law have been exempt from opt-outs. And so you will still be able to see data uh, for those items. And then just some kind of uh, techie terms here, but just uh, in case anyone's curious that, you know, CRISP really takes privacy and security seriously. And so we are uh, essentially accredited and certified at the highest level that we can possibly be um, as an HIE and as an IT uh, company. Um, we also take privacy very seriously and we have software that monitors, uh, you know, who's looking at which patients um, that, and it flags abnormal activity, uh, you know, Things like, hey, I'm a pediatrician, but I'm looking up a senior citizen. Um, it will flag things like that that seem suspicious or potentially inappropriate. And so we really keep a close eye and ensure that people are appropriately using our services. 
And so getting into the nitty gritty, um, I'll just go through some of these services and show you a snapshot um, and screenshots of what some of these look like, just so that you have an idea um, of the user interfaces. Um, so probably our most popular program um, and tool that we support um, because it's required by the state um, is the prescription drug monitoring program. Um, we all know this, this program was meant to combat the opioid epidemic in Maryland, and CRISP is the administrator of that program. And so we essentially support a statewide secure electronic database that contains Schedule 2 through 5 uh, medications that have been dispensed in the state of Maryland. You also are able to view interstate data um, through interstate data sharing agreements. And so if a patient has gone to DC or Virginia to fill a prescription uh, for these controlled substances, you are able to get that information. This is just a snapshot of what that PDMP view looks like. And so you can see here that we have kind of everything you need to know about that particular medication, including the name, when it was filled, who filled it and where. Um, we also show payment method, um, whether that's cash, uh, Medicare, uh, whatever insurance company they may have billed through. Um, and that can be helpful just to understand um, you know, where your patients are going and how they're getting their meds. Uh, Dr. Daniels uh, alluded to this um, view as well. Um, we, in order to support the PDMP and your clinical decision-making, um, we have PDMP advisories that we work in partnership with the state to come up with. Um, and these include average daily, daily MMEs, overlapping opioid and benzo um, dispenses, overlapping opioid dispenses, and then uh, total prescribers and pharmacies. And this can be really helpful as you know, you're reviewing patient information, trying to understand if people are going to different places and getting different medications. Um, you know, it's just kind of more um, information about that patient. And then lastly, kind of in connection with PDMP, um, we do show overdose alerts. And so as you are reviewing the PDMP, um, you may want to know whether that patient has experienced a non-fatal overdose uh, related to uh, substance use. And so if that is the case, we would show uh, a pop-up clinical alert letting you know that that uh, event happened, when it happened, and at which hospital. Um, and that's just kind of extra information. You know, you, it, it's not meant to stop you from prescribing, but it's just something that can be, you know, another item that perhaps you want to um, have a conversation with the patient about. And then for the clinical information, um, this information is populated from all of our participant data that's sent to us. And so that's all Maryland hospitals plus DC and West Virginia, as I mentioned. Um, we have feeds with LabCorp and Quest. And so any outpatient provider who has LabCorp and Quest account numbers can choose to send us uh, a copy of all the labs that are ordered through their account. Uh, we're connected to, the, to all um, hospital radiology. Uh, centers plus about 12 of the biggest outpatient radiology centers. Um, so we really have a pretty robust data set when it comes to clinical records. Um, just to note that when you're in here and you're looking at information, almost everything that you see is um, printable and downloadable um, to PDF uh, format. And so if it's something that you think is relevant and you'd like to put a copy of you know, their most recent labs in a patient chart, um, you are able to do that. Um, specifically for labs, um, and just so that you can see, uh, we do curate these in a view that's easy to read. And so if there are abnormal results in that particular lab test, uh, we do flag them um, so that they're easy to kind of catch and understand. Um, and you can see that this is really, you know, this is meant to just augment your information and your history um, of your patient and hopefully to reduce duplication of service. Radiology reports, I know these are super relevant in your specialty, um, but we, we have not only the radiology reports, um, but if we are connected to the, the source that actually did the image, uh, we do have the images available as well. And so you would be able to see a little camera icon next to any report that we have a corresponding image for. And these are diagnostic quality images that you're able to view right within your browser. Um, and this can be great if you're looking to see a comparison, if the patient, you know, forgot to bring the CD with them, um, you can check here to see if we've got a copy of that particular image. 
And then of course, the other clinical notes, and these can include things like discharge notes, progress notes, HMPs, consult notes, um, and much, much more. And so this is really a great way to get much more robust uh, medical history, enhanced care coordination. You can imagine patients think they know what they were told on discharge. Um, they lost the discharge paperwork. Um, and so this is a great way to perhaps go and look at, hey, what was actually your discharge? Um, you know, what were actually your discharge instructions? How were your medications changed? Um, you can get a lot of information from these clinical notes. And then we have a care coordination um, a section in our clinical information tab. And um, this is gonna show you a few things. Um, the first is the care team. And this is gonna show you who else has a treatment relationship with the patient um, and, has, and has told Chris about that relationship. And so you may be seeing that patient, but perhaps you don't even know who the primary care physician is, or maybe they have a cardiologist but don't remember the name. Um, this is a great place to look to see, okay, who else is actually caring for this patient? We can start to coordinate care. Um, we also have care alerts, which is a really unique kind of Maryland thing. Um, and essentially a care alert is a quick snippet of really critical need to know information that perhaps you wouldn't otherwise find um, by digging into a patient's chart. So things like behavioral issues, safety issues, um, you know, things that you might want to know right up front without having any other knowledge about the patient, um, you can find in a care alert. We also show referral history. Um, if the patient's been referred to any community-based organizations or other programs like diabetes prevention programs. And then lastly, we show advanced directives um, and we partner with AD Vault or mydirectives.com um, to populate any advanced care planning documents that have been completed through them. Um, and so you'd be able to see most forms and advanced directives and other forms like that. And then lastly, we show um, social needs. As we know, you know, social needs and social determinants of health are a big component of healthcare and the overall health of the patient. And so this is increasingly important as we, you know, as healthcare providers are seeing patients and making sure that they are, are all around um, healthy individuals. Um, and so we have partnered with many facilities to actually pull in social needs assessments that they are um, completing within their own systems. And we flag any uh, social needs that have been identified. So for example, if the patient has food insecurity or a living situation problem, um, we would flag that so that other care providers are aware of that fact. Um, we also show um, ICD-10Z codes that are related to social needs, um, just so that the entire care team is aware of a potential um, social need that may have been identified in the past. And then as for our care coordination bucket, I mentioned our encounter notification service. These are real-time or batched alerts to providers uh, based on that treatment relationship. And you would tell us about your treatment relationship by, telling, by sending us a roster of your patients, either manually or automatically through your EMR. And essentially we would spit back to you um, anytime a patient of yours on that list um, is in and out of a hospital or a SNF, um, or even has a primary care appointment um, if that primary care provider is sending us the data. Um, and this is a really great interactive tool to kind of help track your patients, um, look at what they were admitted for, um, and start to coordinate care and get them back in for follow-ups that they may need. And then kind of the next step above encounter notification services are this concept of a smart alert. And, you know, we understand that, you know, a specialty provider such as a podiatrist might not be interested, you know, every time somebody, you know, either scrapes themselves or maybe they hit their head on something, but you might have a very specific need to know about, hey, I want to know all of my patients that are being admitted to the ED for a diabetic reason, for example. Um, and so we can actually curate and kind of hone in on and narrow down which notifications are sent to you based on your needs um, so that you really can um, prioritize and outreach these patients effectively um, and kind of remove all of the noise um, that might come with a normal ENS workflow. As for CRISP reporting services, we have a couple of reporting suites that I think would be relevant to you all. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of these are based off of hospital case mix and Medicare claims data. Um, and you can really get a sense of your overall utilization. 
Um, these are dashboards that are available to any CRISP participant. Um, the first is really just a hospital panel enrollment dashboard, and that's going to tell you, hey, of my thousand patients, uh, you know, what's the hospital utilization like? And that can be sliced and diced by payer, it can be sliced by timeline, race, ethnicity, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so you can really start to hone in on specific populations um, and your high risk um, patients. We also support um, a pre-post analysis, which can be really interesting if you guys are at all providing interventions to your patients. And so, for example, if you are supporting a diabetes prevention program, you can actually run a pre-post analysis, <coughs> excuse me, um, to monitor utilization prior to and after that intervention. And then lastly, Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to touch on the public health data utility aspect of things. As we mentioned earlier in the presentation, CRISP has been designated um, to operate as a health data utility for the state. <coughs> and so we are really working closely to identify really innovative use cases and where we can kind of help fill the gaps when it comes to data. And really the, the pillars here of, data, of, of a health data utility and the value add um, is number one, CRISP is able, CRISP as the HIE is able to enrich data that's not otherwise available. We can link data sets and we can improve data feeds. Um, and that just makes things become more useful um, when people are looking at them. <coughs> we can distribute information in ways that perhaps the state alone couldn't. Um, and we have a lot of, um, you know, engaged providers and engaged audiences that we can help to push information to. And then lastly, because we have clinical data, we're able to enable public health interventions by informing folks at the point of care um, of various things such as diabetes, opioid use, et cetera. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Um, and then lastly, public health infrastructure. So this is kind of some of the stuff we've been doing to support this infrastructure. Um, we've done a lot of COVID reporting analytics, contact tracing for COVID and monkeypox, um, EMS data pulled in to show at the point of care, um, to name a few. <clears throat> and then, of course, there's a focus on health equity. You can never forget about health equity and social determinants um, as you're thinking about public health. And so we do things like enrich data uh, with race and ethnicity information that we have in-house. We enable social determinants of health referrals. Um, and we actually are also connect. <coughs> excuse me connecting with third party social needs vendors such as Aunt Bertha and Maryland 211. And you can see that we have some near term um, HDU activities, some of which I mentioned before, we're leveraging existing data feeds to do things like uh, inform providers of when patients may be up for Medicaid redetermination. We are um, sharing best practices um, amongst both just our internal Maryland stakeholders, but also sharing with other HIEs and, um, you know, hopefully supporting their strategies um, in their states. And of course, um, you know, we try to be ahead of the game and, and really um, just participate as, as the industry is moving forward. And we try to participate in pilots um, and that way we can really prove um, proof of concepts um, and hopefully get some really innovative use cases up and off the ground. So that's kind of a really quick flyover overview of CRISP. Um, we've got lots more information at our website, crisphealth.org. And if anybody's interested in onboarding or wants to know more, um, we can do things like one-on-one -on -one demos and kind of review onboarding processes. Um, we are happy to facilitate that. Um, there's my contact information. And that's it for me. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daniels and Patel. Um, we will now open it up for questions and uh, answers. Um, as a reminder, please raise your hand using the hand icon uh, to be recognized uh, or enter in your questions into the uh, chat box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, to raise your hand, you go under the reactions menu and then you can use the raise your hand function.
Um, if we are not able to get to your question, uh, we'll be sure to share this information with presenters um, after the webinar, and we'll be sure to uh, send that information to you via email. Um, so to get started, we do have a few questions for Dr. Dan uh, for Dr. Daniels and Patel, and I will start with you, Dr. Daniels. So um, what does Chris help me with in my practice, Dr. Daniels? So I utilize CRISP for patients that I'm not familiar with, uh, patients who are new patients uh, who come to me specifically in wound clinic from outsourced vendors. So the first thing I always do is I look in our own information database, and if there's nothing recent for that patient, I will go into CRISP and I will look for any progress notes, hospital discharge, x-rays, uh, lab results, anything that's you know recent that gives me an idea of what the patient has been doing before they get to me. Uh, my population tends to be a little older and a little sicker, and they're not the best historians as a group, so they forget things or they have such comprehensive medical histories that they just don't remember everything. Um, and people tend to also tell you what they think is important, not necessarily what we need to know. So by going on to CRISP and looking at all of this information, um, I get a better idea. And I find that when I walk into a room and I start asking patients very pointed questions about their medical history, that they seem somewhat impressed that I know this information. And I say, well, you know, I looked, at, I looked you up before I got here. So, uh, you know, it gives them also a little bit of confidence that you're walking into this room and that, you know, they're not a stranger and they're going to get more than, you know, I think some studies showed that we give 23 seconds or something like that's worth of attention to patients, but that you're actually paying attention and you know what's going on with their history and can provide them with some solutions for their problems. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. That was really very helpful. Um, just shedding light on how you're using it and how we can uh, help as well with um, coordinating the care of patients. Uh, so this question is uh, for you as well, and uh, Dr. Patel, if you would also please uh, provide an answer. Uh, so what are the benefits of using CRISP and what's really in it for podiatrists? Why should they do this? You wanna go first, Dr. Daniels? Sure, please, Dr. Patel. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think um, Dr. Daniels mentioned a few of these reasons. I think that having this information at your fingertips essentially gives you a better idea of what's happening with your patient. You're able to get much more information than either they can provide or that you have time to go and coordinate with all of their providers to try and find. Um, and so it's a nice one-stop shop to get information about patients. Um, and then, of course, the population health level information can really help as you're trying to plan strategically about programs and interventions that you might, and partnerships, um, you know, with other organizations that you might be considering in the future. So it's definitely value add in my opinion. And I, I agree completely. I mean, the, the other thing to consider in this whole process is, is we are going further and further and further in health technology. And then Dr. Patel might be able to shine some light on this. Um, and this information is being collected and available to everybody. So it's only a matter of time before all of our notes from all of our electronic medical record systems are in there. Um, it's, I don't think it's an if, I just think it's a when, in which case, you know, patients are going to have, you know, excuse me, we are going to have access to all of the patient's information back to the beginning of, you know, CRISP itself, I guess. Um, but, you know, when you're looking through that information, you can get information overload as well. So filtering the information to the relevant portions for us, you know, we're not primary care physicians, so, you know, we can focus in more, although um, I do a lot of review of records that you wouldn't think are relevant to what we're doing and find all kinds of interesting things that other doctors put in their notes almost as a second thought that all of a sudden triggers me to do something, you know, that I would not have been on the road to doing without that information. So I, I see the value there. But, you know, other doctors are going to do that, too. And, and the other thing is, is, you know, you, you can't be part of an integrated health system unless people know who you are. And having your notes available to be read by other specialties, whether it be primary care or other surgical subspecialties, et cetera, uh, is only going to help us as a, as a profession, uh, you know, and really help our patients because they have to know who we are and they have to know what we do. And most of the way that people really learn about us is by reading our notes. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Daniels. That was really insightful. And Dr. Patel had shared earlier during her presentation about how um, for care coordination parts, you could basically to get specific care alerts, they can go about setting that up. If you could touch a little bit more on that, Dr. Patel, if a podiatrist wanted to set specific parameters, how they would go about it. Yeah, so once you're um, enrolled or onboarded to CRISP um, and you're sending us that patient roster, it's simply another column on that patient roster spreadsheet where you can relay whatever it is that makes sense to relay about your patients that might be really critical for other folks to know about. Um, you know, next of kin, um, you can, you know, relay uh, who, who should be called at your office, perhaps, um, if the patient happens to show up in an ED. And so it's a really simple way um, to relay information to folks that you aren't likely to know to communicate with otherwise. <clears throat> Thank you so much uh, for sharing that, Dr. Patel. And I think this is a question that uh, most people might have if you're not familiar with CRISP but are not already using um, health information exchange with your practice. How much does CRISP cost? Is there a cost associated with uh, kind of getting set up with CRISP? Sure. Um, yeah, so CRISP is available at no cost um, to providers. We are very lucky in the state of Maryland to be supported by um, hospital user fees and lots and lots of grant money in partnership with the state and federal government. And so that allows us to provide these services at no cost to our outpatient providers. <clears throat> I will say that if you choose to kind of integrate more fully um, and send us lots and lots of data, which we would love, um, directly out of your EMR, um, your EMR might have costs associated with implementing those data feeds, um, but you would not have any costs directly from us. Um, to participate or send in data. Thank you so much. Um, and in a similar vein, how do folks uh, go about onboarding to CRISP? What is the process, if you could describe that for us? Sure. Um, so once you're interested in joining, or if you just want to get more information, um, you can actually just even email um, support at crisphealth.org. Um, and what we do is we assign a dedicated account executive um, to you and your organization, and they will walk you through all of the paperwork. Um, it's like two agreements, um, and then how to set up and send in that patient panel. Um, and then the last piece would really be deciding who at your facility needs access to, to view CRISP data. Um, and so we have a dedicated resource that will be available um, to onboard you. And once you're onboarded to train you, um, however often you might need. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Um, and then uh, going back to you, Dr. Daniel, you kind of touched on this uh, during your presentation, but just providing some specifics of where can folks uh, find Chris? So for, for us, there's a specific tab that's on our, our, our uh, internal medical record system in Cerner. Um, we also have a tab on our own system in Prognosis. Um, but if you don't have access or you're not using an EHR study, if you go to crisphealth.org, you can log in right through the webpage. It's, it's, it's very, very easy. Um, when I was doing prep for this lecture, I was looking back and I actually signed up for CRISP in 2014. So I found my 2014 participation agreement. And I found that to be kind of amusing because I didn't realize it had been around quite that long. But it's very, very simple to get information from. Um, you know, if you think back to way back to 2009, when the High Tech Act was actually passed, and we all were, you know, encouraged to use electronic medical records, CRISP is the product of what that was intended. So, you know, this is what the federal government paid all us money to convert to, so we can have these information exchanges, because it really does improve patient care. And, and again, you know, if you have a patient who is in a hospital that you're not on staff at three weeks ago, and they had an MRI then, for their Achilles injury, you know, you don't need to get another one. But if you didn't know they had it and they don't tell you, which is stuff I find all the time, having that information in CRISP ahead of time really will improve your care. Because not only can you go and find out that they had it, you absolutely will get the report. And for some of them, you'll even be able to look at the images yourself. I'm a big proponent. I don't really do anything without looking at images myself. I don't believe reports unto themselves. Um, so I, I do that all the time. And it's it's just incredibly valuable to be able to, to even just for a simple x-ray, to look at an x-ray from last week from the ED as opposed to having to take another one. Um, and patients really, really are impressed when you do that. Thank you so very much, Dr. Daniels. Um, I would like to open it up to the audience at this 
time for anybody who wanted to ask a question um, verbally, you can raise your hand using the reactions menu at the bottom of the screen, or you could just chat your question and I'll pause just to give folks um, some time to unmute themselves and ask questions. All right, so uh, hearing no further question, um, I want to say thank you to everyone for attending today's Podiatry um, Health Information Exchange webinar. We hope that you found this information valuable. Uh, so following this event, you receive an email that includes a link to the questionnaire. And the questionnaire requests feedback on the webinar and includes an application for CME credit. We would appreciate your feedback even if you're not applying for CME credit. Um, so please uh, take the time to complete that survey. So thank you again to everyone for joining this uh, webinar this afternoon and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. Have a nice weekend, everybody. <laughs>